gets us to the golden rule. This is the Wizard of Id golden rule, of course. He who has the gold makes the rules. That it then becomes important to know how the rules for the economy are established. Who gets to make the rules? We're going to have rules about how the economy is governed, but how is it determined who gets to make those rules? And so that's that's what I'm trying to do in, in that, that class, is just to raise those kinds of issues. So, because from what we learned, a lot of the... Um a lot of the people who had money was the nobility, especially, mm -hmm. um, you know, in the medieval time and even afterwards and to the modern era, I mean, well, not modern era, but you know, 19th century, nobility played a huge role because they had all the money. Sure. And right? they make the rules. And they make the rules. Right? And they make the rules to help them keep their money. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that's what I meant when, when we were talking about Africa, that now all these, like, these affluent people who were in charge and these generals and all this, they had, you know, they were the most powerful within these societies. And now they are not put in power. Because that's a, do you, do you believe that's a Western way of doing economics? Or you oh, think I that's think that's, I, I think you'd find that in most places at most times, people have made rules so that the wealthy get to keep their money. I feel like that's just general. I mean, what did we learn about in Beard? With Beard. Right. Yeah, <laughs> I guess it's a post so. That was a good one. I that really was, enjoyed that, that was. Book. It was a lot of reading, <laughs> especially some pages. But, but like, it wasn't it wasn't difficult to read though. No, it was really simple, and I liked it, and I liked how controversial it was, and that's just a, like just aspects, another aspect of you know our nation that we don't talk about, you know, a perspective that whether or not is right, it's our interpretation of whether we think it, but why is it an open discussion? Why is it that we can't have discussions about it? That's kind of the issue I have with it, you know. That it, it, it raises some good points. That we should be able to talk about these points. But the government's like, no, 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 no. No, you can't talk about this. <laughs> you know, that, that, that to me is a problem. What the government can say is acceptable and not acceptable for society. When society, society should be the one that's saying whether what's acceptable yeah. or what's not for it. So, government interference, government interaction, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Um... That's just my, that's my take on it, you know, just, uh, what, nobody should be able to tell me what I can and, can and can't read, or can and can't write about, Yeah. you know, I should have that right to do that, you know, as a, as a human, as someone learning history, it should be something that's presented, and something that's discussed, not something that's hidden, yeah. and not, you know. As we talked about earlier, was that, you know, that's what Kant argues in his, what is enlightenment. Mm -hmm. Suppose I'm, I'm still thinking, I mean, I'm still on Nicaragua because it's, it's still fresh in my mind, but I suppose Nicaragua, from what I read, is one of the only countries that if the United States pulled out any aid, which it already has in the past, it will still be one of the only countries in Central America that can be self-sustaining. And that is through what the Samosas built up. Through their dictatorship of all the programs that they were making money off of, keeping their status quo alive, they were still, in turn, building up Nicaragua, which is why, because of the systems that he was putting in place, the economic structure of of Nicaragua was was there. Nicaragua's trade was just huge through, globally. And she said, when she was younger, the Cordoba, which is the Nicaraguan currency, was 7 to 1 to the American dollar. It was, it was pretty close, and now it's, that's... Inflation has killed it, but it's still, it was consistent at seven. It was consistently there to where the lifestyle in the crowd was higher at times for some people like her, because she was affluent. It was higher for her. So when he was thrown down, she kind of lost a little bit too. So she, so it was kind of like embedded within his administration if he was successful. Well, not just not just him, but his family, because his family wasn't powerful over forty years. Right. So if they, so they kind of embedded themselves. Yeah. With them. That's insane. That's crazy yeah. to think about. And I think there are economists now, from what I've read, that they say if they overthrow Ortega, the Nicaraguan people have enough juice within their economic structure to keep them fiscally hmm. going. 
and you're not going to find a single thing like that in Nicaragua, I feel like, because then they'd be like, okay, now we can just overthrow them if we're going to be okay. <laughs> Which is hard to think about because a lot of the revolutions and civil wars and things that happen, you know, of overtaking governments, they kind of just get to that point. Like when we learned in Kishlansky with, um, <laughs> with the Glorious Revolution, like, all right, we got rid of the king. Now what? That <laughs> well, always just seems to be the... <laughs> it leaves a power vacuum. It yeah. does. And the power vacuum that was left, I can't remember her name, but she was a woman who became president, and she was fairly communist, but people liked her. And then Ortega came in, then they kicked him out in the thousands, and he came back, and it's just like, whoa, now everything's kind of hitting the fan again, but, yeah, it's, I don't know, it's crazy how much connects historically from Africa to Nicaragua to Germany to the United States, you know, they're all connected somehow, and it's, I guess maybe that's where learning the skill is important, because then you can make the skill connection around everything else. If you know how to do research and Figure, find out things for yourself, you know. Mm -hmm. Which is part of the reason I do want to teach at a Catholic school <laughs> instead of a public school because you aren't subjugated to those same standards of students need to learn to do this and they need to learn to do that. You know, within a, a Catholic school system, you know, you still have to learn some type of Catholicism, but mm -hmm. teachers are given the freedom to talk about what they want. Oh, I had a teacher in high school who... Uh, would talk to us about, you know, conspiracies. It, it was a history of Chicago course, yeah. and, you know, he liked to swear a lot in his class. That's just fine. And, you know, he had us write a conspiracy paper on whether Harvey Lee Oswald actually killed Kennedy. He showed us videos, he gave us the evidence, and said, okay, go to town. And that's the only thing I remember from his course. But I remember more from his course than other courses. Yeah. Because we were given the freedom to think for ourselves. It's a big thing. That that's something I told you. I wrote in in my paper like that. That shift into like having this like free thought, free way of thinking. I feel like that needs to. That's where I want to style my teaching around. Like to have students really open their minds about things. The the first lesson I ever taught, um, which happened like a month ago, because <laughs> <laughs> I've been observing for so long. And it just it, at a point it just gets boring. Really, I mean, three semesters worth of observing. I did, it's supposed to be two semesters, but I wanted to do that, like continue the extra semester of observation because I know if I didn't, getting back into observation would be pretty rough. Like, mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to still be in the classroom and still be able to, you know, move into things and then in the summer, you know, not lose too much, <laughs> retain some things and then when I get into, you know, my next observation, it'll be okay. But I taught my first lesson um, and it was, they were learning about enlightenment thinkers. And uh, there was a quote from each Enlightenment thinker, like whenever they, like, um, oh God, like Voltaire and um, all those guys. I can't remember <laughs> their names right now. Montesquieu, you know, all of them. He taught this lesson a month ago and he forgot. Yeah. Right? Well, we took their, like, their philosophical idea and we changed it into more of like a school related question. So, like, our, um, our, Girl students, the same academically as boy students. Do you see the glass half full or half empty? Do students have the rights to make their own rules in the classroom? All these, like, these controversial questions, and they had to say whether they agree or disagree, um, strongly agree, strongly disagree. And then they would get up, and they would choose one side of the room, and we would read the questions. But the idea was, when I watched the students uh, you know, choose their side, I asked them, like, why did you choose this side? You chose it, you can't just say, I don't know, or there's too many people over here. You know, why would you choose it? And I really wanted to see students, like, the gears start turning, to really understand that, you know, to take these questions as what they are, but to also think in the general sense of, you know, the society that you live in. You know, do you see the glass half full or half empty? You know, um, do, can you, um, do you have the right, or can you make your own rules for yourself, and things like that, and just to really get those gears turning. And that's what I wanted to see, and that's what kind of, like, changed the gears into uh, why I wanted to do teaching, because... I feel like through history we can do that. We can have these kids ask these hard questions mm -hmm. that we haven't come, you know, that we haven't um, recognized or like reconciliated with ourselves about, like the issue with slavery and the South and mm -hmm. um, immigrants in this country and all these different issues that we don't.
talk about because people are sensitive. Like I mentioned mm-hmm. earlier, it's a sensitive time for yeah. people in America. But I feel like with this next generation and how tech savvy they are and how it's just, there's, there's no filter. Like he's, <laughs> I have a brother who's in who's in uh, ninth grade, like his freshman year, and just that culture. Because I I hang out with him like every other day just to see how he is. You know, he's in sports and all these you know high end classes and whatever. And I want to know like what how high school is for him and the people he hangs out with and the culture that's happening right now. The culture I'm going into that I'm going to be teaching a year, you know, and to figure out that and how it's changing you know to and i feel like that's where it starts you know to to really get the kids when their mind is you know trying to pick up new things to change it right there to make you know more changes so that we can become more of a less a less sensitive society because we discuss things and we don't push things down or kick the can down the road like we actually face it for what it is you know so <coughs> and so how do you think philosophy has like changed your way of doing history or has in a good way, bad way? Um, I think for one thing, I, I am much more comfortable talking about those meta meta issues, meta cognitive, meta physical, meta ethical issues that are involved in, in, in studying history. That's why I like doing the senior seminar. Mm-hmm. I think that that's a, uh, that's a class that's almost tailor made for me, <laughs> because you know, I, I like raising those kinds of issues, and you, you know we don't really have another forum in the curriculum where those kinds of issues can be raised. Do you think that we should be teaching these students, like students in high school? I mean, for sure, definitely in higher education. But do you think that these should be something that's at least laid down a foundation for for when they get to higher education for these? Or do you think that it's only important in the field that you go into? I really don't know because I don't have a good handle on what high school kids are like now. Rough. But, Rough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I think we have to do something because the study of history is, is too important for decision making in a democratic society and we're giving it short shrift because it doesn't seem to be practical. But, you know, to me, you know, there's just so many issues that you can't address if you don't address them through a historical lens. Well, everything has has a history. Which is why, yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> why I'm studying history because, you know, I do just about anything. Yeah. But, the first thing I would do is throw out the textbooks. Mm-hmm. I would I would get rid of them, with, without a doubt, and replace them with monographs, even at the high school level. There are some good, well-written monographs that are perfectly suitable for uh, a, a high school level audience. Because the problem for me with the, the, the textbook is that that comes at you as an authority. This, the contents, history becomes, it is your job to memorize the content of this book because we are going to play Jeopardy and it is your job to spin back the obscure <laughs> facts on this test at the appropriate moment. Yep. Yep. And the idea of engaging with the material, thinking about the material, uh, questioning the material isn't there. And it also and this is why I, I teach the way I do, is that that approach destroys your ability to really interact with nonfiction. Because you start reading nonfiction as if any book of nonfiction is approached as if it was a textbook. So the idea, I mean, nobody looks for a thesis in a textbook. No. No. But it is there. It's, Usually it's there, but that's but that's not what's emphasized. Mm-hmm. When you're teaching at, the, at that level, what you're what you're focusing on is learning the names and dates and places. Mm-hmm. See, and what's funny to me with that is that there are teachers who completely and wholeheartedly agree with Lowen, the author of Lies My Teacher Told Me, but yet still use the textbook because there isn't another way, or they don't want to put in the work, or. They don't know how to put in the work, or they see what their college professors do, and they're just like, 
how do I get to that level? I'm just going to stick with this because it's easier, you know, because then how much of it is going to be a heartbreak for you as a teacher because your students aren't going to do the work because maybe the material is too complicated because you have students with, you know, different IEPs and um, trying to present that type of information to that, to those type of students is going to be, you know, you have to really water it down so they understand. So, where then can you put, you know, a seminar style class in a high school? Do you think that would be even viable? I don't know. So, again, I don't have a, a sure, good like, sense of, of where your students are, but I feel like that'd be a good question for Dr. Lakaitis. Yeah. Because Dr. Yeah. Lakaitis has a little more experience with the younger yeah. seniors here, or the younger freshmen here, which are still seniors in high school mentally. Right. So, <laughs> well, the same way freshmen are still eighth graders mentally, and true, and sixth graders are still fifth graders. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? And, and, but, go back. But at the end of the year, they start to mature a little more. Right. But yeah. you know, I'm sure he has a little more of a of an understanding of how high schoolers are just from how the the freshmen are in his class. But yeah, I, I, it probably does. But my, my thinking is that you're not going to get students to mature in their thinking so long as you continue to treat them as immature. That's why I love when you would say write a reflection or professors would ask for reflections because there's not there's not really a right or wrong answer. Of course, there's like, well, is it in line with what you read? Yeah, did you? Are you even coherent in your writing? <laughs> right, but it's just, if you have that idea of what it's trying to talk about, then you can get that out of the way and then talk about how you really think about it yeah. and your perspective on it. And that's where the critical thinking comes in. And that's where really expanding, that's the part I want kids to, that's the part I want kids to get, is to expand on creating their own argument, using evidence, analyzing text, and like using it all together to, Make an argument because making an argument when I was writing these papers, making the argument was the fun part because it's like, yeah. what is it that I'm going to be researching? What is it that I'm going to be doing? And how many times I had to like go different directions and where I wanted to go, the amount of times I had to delete pages just to <laughs> start somewhere fresh and start somewhere new. It's it, heartbreaking, it is heartbreaking, <laughs> but at the same time, once you, once you have that, it's like, well, that was better than what I wrote before, yeah. yeah. Now it's better structured, but to then you add your own like opinion, your own, you know aspect of what you're thinking and that just makes you know things so much more fascinating that's why in my 1000 level classes i've stopped giving exams yep it's all they keep a journal and that's all i ask of them is a mm -hmm. journal really? really how does that work so you just they write down every class or they they need to do a, a reflection on each chapter of the book that we're reading and then on each class session okay and it's not too bad. Do you no. give them time in class to do their reflections? No, okay. No, it's, it's for discussion. Yeah. Which, I mean, then if you could just, everything that you discuss and then your opinion on it, I mean, that. Yeah, no, it's enough for a thing. I'm just asking, you know, just a couple of paragraphs, just a paragraph or two. That's how I feel, like, in going into, like, with homework and tests and quizzes, like, obviously that's what you're supposed to do, a way of getting formative assessment, formative assessment. Yeah. And summative assessment. But. I feel like that's just going to continue to do the same thing that history is just a memorization of names, dates, and places. Whereas if you're writing, it could be different, you know, given maybe the students a wider variety in what to talk about and maybe a place where they can add their own perspective because that's the whole point of you know, history because everyone has different perspectives. So you brought up a question the other day when I asked you to come onto the podcast if I think that students should do podcasts instead of papers or, you know, along with the papers or whatever. And I, I do wonder if the quality that you're looking for, I, I, did, I did raise some questions like, how are you going to judge the content? How is it going to be? But, you know, similar format to a paper. Um, and I do wonder if you may hear a better argument verbally because you know, our day and age, we are pretty skilled with technology where people are on Facebook and Snapchat and all these different social medias expressing their their wording and however they want. So do you think within a podcast that would be, you would get more out of a student? I'm thinking that I'd like to give, I'd like to make the experiment because let's face it, when you get out into the real world, nobody 
writes a five paragraph argumentative essay. Mm -hmm. Nobody cares about what your margins are. Nobody cares what font you use. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and yet, you know, we spend so much time saying you must have one inch margins and you must, you know, you must have the this this is the heading. I want the date in this format and all that kind of petty <laughs> stuff that n nobody outside of academia is ever going to care about. So why not do something like a podcast, which is something that students are, you know, conversant with. They know what a podcast is. That's one of the reasons why I started having them do these short documentaries. Mm -hmm. Because, well, one of the things is there's a unit in the class where we look at documentaries on food and we analyze the documentaries. Because I, I think that just as we don't bring, we don't teach kids how to read monographs, we also de don't teach them how to critically analyze a documentary. Mm -hmm. And how much information do we take in through documentaries? You know, we don't we don't give people the tools to analyze, and so that's why. So the idea is we watch some documentaries, analyze the documentaries, and then they go make a documentary of their own. Okay, I like that. And have you found it to be successful? By and large, uh, you know, uh, you know, there, there's nothing here that's going to win an Academy Award. <laughs> But I think that because, first of all, it's team, team taught. I mean, it's a team project. Mm -hmm. They're doing something that's of interest to them. I mean, come on. Who doesn't like going up to Devon Avenue and walking around the shops there or going to a restaurant? You know, it's a food course. So you go to a restaurant and you, photo, you, know, you take a, make a video of your meal. It's not hard, and you know, it, and you do a little bit of research on Devon Avenue. You do take some pictures, put in a voiceover. It's not it's not hard. It's it, so because I think it's a fun project for most of the students. Mm -hmm. uh, the The problem comes, you know, when uh, you know, obviously not everybody is is skilled in videography. And, you know, if you're just using your phone, the quality of the images is not terribly great. But that's, you know, for the first time through something like that, I think it's fine. Most of the time, you know, so most of the time it works pretty well. So do you have free reign on how you want some of the assessments for, uh, for a class? I don't know. As a, as a professor? Yeah. Yeah, no, I don't have to. I don't have any particular kind of thing. The summative assessment in the food class is that the student presents a family recipe. Ooh, they, oh. they write a family recipe, and then as an addendum to the recipe, they write a, a short essay in which they describe the significance of that dish to their family and their family's history. And then they write a second short essay where they talk about the history of the dish or some aspect of the dish, whether it's a particular ingredient, where it came from, how it got there, or something about the techniques in it. And then I'll take all the uh, 70 uh, recipes, put them together, and everybody will get a cookbook for Christmas. Oh, oh that's really cool. Oh, damn. That's really, really cool. That's awesome. Wow. So, wow. That's awesome. Look at that. Wow. See, that's what happens when you have free reign to do whatever the hell you want. But no, you get the creative freedom. You get the creative and freedom. And you have the autonomy to... Yeah, I, and, I, that's, that's awesome. And, this, and, the student, and the thing is, if you're not a historian by training, you know, have a real interest in training, you're only going to remember stuff if it has some relevance to you. I think that's what Becker, Becker argues. Mm -hmm. And so if you're talking about the history of a dish that comes out of your family, you're going to remember what you've learned, you know, about where cinnamon comes from or, you know, how potatoes got to Ireland. Stuff like that. That you're going to remember because of the, the personal connection. Mm -hmm. And if I were to, you know, just to, to put down a, you know, to come up with a multiple choice test about food in history, 
uh, uh, keep all the, don't take the air out of the course. It would be kind yeah. of a disservice to what you're trying to do as well. Yeah. Huh. Because the idea is, you know, I frankly don't care what they learn out of this course. What I... <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I, I, know, I, know. I I don't care what they learn out of this course, so long as what they get out of it is that studying history can be fun or interesting. Yeah. <laughs> That's what, yeah. Because... No, I mean this, somebody, is, this is experience here. Yeah, like that, this, this, what you have is pure experience with teaching. Yeah, this because you know most of the time you spend fighting people's the attitudes that people have towards history. They they come in, they've had bad experiences, and you have to fight it. Mm -hmm. And so what I try to do is basically disarm, you know, create a create a situation where. Uh, People are, you know, they're reading stuff that's interesting. I mean, did you know, for example, that the origin, that if you trace the history of ketchup back, you'll come to a per, uh, Chinese fish sauce? I did not know that. <laughs> I did not know that. No. <laughs> I guess I don't know much about the history of food. No, it, it, most, it, it's not, it's not one of the, you know, not one of the major topics, but. That's still that's still Just, interesting to know, though. Yeah. yeah, not that it's gonna come up and you know, but but cocktail parties. Yeah, <laughs> true. <laughs> Did you know? <laughs> yeah, that's you know what. That's something I've always struggled with because one of the biggest things that they talk about in our educational class is connecting with the students, and um, that is just a great example of how to you know to connect with students and to actually have them interested. You know, because we could just lecture all the things that we've learned, like how the world is. Like, if I were to just lecture everything I've learned this semester alone to kids, I'd lose. You'd have to start a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I'd lose all of them in a matter of, like, five minutes. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Every day. And you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to have the kids interacting with the lesson and to actually want to learn about that. And I feel like that's something that we need to focus on. Me, personally, I need to focus on making it more interesting for the students than, but I feel like just that alone, you know what I mean? Like comparing to what they have in the textbook, compared to what we've learned and showing the students that contrast between that, saying, well, what do you think? That will bring students to really, I feel in my opinion, to really ask those hard questions and to actually be interested in. Like, not not in my experience. <laughs> you know, I, I tried to incorporate textbook to their own research and they remember their research more than anything else the textbook talks about. And when I tried to have them like, compare and contrast, they couldn't compare and contrast without the text. Mm -hmm. They needed the textbook because they don't remember anything from it. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's on their computer. And I am a believer that you can't learn from like a screen. Even if you're reading a book, you still won't process the material the same way you process it when you read a hardcover book. And I think there's been studies on that yep. that, that prove that. And these students have their textbooks on their computers. They don't remember half of the things that they learned from the textbook. Mm -hmm. But the things that I've taught them outside of the textbook, you know, the assembly line activity that I did with them where I shut off the lights and I took a pencil, I snapped someone's pencil in half or I fired people. And, you know, I had students become foremen of these <laughs> companies where they were drawing out T-shirts, uh, which eventually led into the Triangle Shirt Respect ah. Um but they were drawing these these t-shirts and they were having such a good time with it and they understood the concept of an assembly line which they hated it yeah but they understood it and and I said now put yourself in you know the shoes of somebody who was working in an assembly line how do you think they would feel and you know it was that connection where they have a, a super good you know paragraph in the textbook where I enjoyed the paragraph I thought it was informative but man, was it boring. <laughs> and it's something that they wouldn't even try to learn if it was just a text. Mm -hmm. So where I say it's not my experience, that's, you know, every class is different. Though Some classes right. will be much better with doing that than others. Of course. I think that the, the one thing that improved my teaching more than anything else was abandoning the notion of coverage. Mm -hmm. Well, the idea that you start with... Uh, you know, the second half of a world history class in 1500, and you march people through 
everything, you know, to 2018. Yeah, to 2018, and that you, you make sure that you cover all of the important names and dates and places. It's a perfectly, you know, I mean, they're, it's a well-respected. They're good yeah. courses. I learned a little bit from them, <laughs> but just because of the scope of the material. Right. It's a lot. And to just yeah. march it down that way, I mean, that would seem the easiest and most efficient, just to, like, hear the most important things from yeah. then till now. I think a big misconception that we're taught is that history is linear. Yeah. Um, you know, just like, you know, I think that we'll start getting into, like, the meta- spiritual and metaphysical thought but you know it's not linear the way we can pick and choose what we like and how it still goes around and connects somehow with today is something that's starting to be taught at least in schools but it's not there and i don't think it's going to be there until you have that groundbreaking person who really it helps to push it you know and i, I do think that it's going to start from the university level i don't think it's going to start from Second grade. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think there's anybody in second who teaches second grade that has the kind of authority that would make no. a kind of change like that. But it always starts with the younger generation, with everything. With most world-changing events, it starts with the younger generation, like the Revolution of 1848. There's <laughs> just a lot of, in, in like Germany and all over Europe, it was young kids, like these like these younger generation having this, these new ideas and these new concepts are like, we need to enforce this, and then the conservatives are like, no, don't change how things are because things are good. It's always how it's going to be. It's always going to be like that. that today. I, I fear. I, I, I would like to intervene in this, and I think I'm fairly progressive in the <laughs> my teaching, and I've changed a whole lot. But not, not, think, every, not everybody. <laughs> well, I'm, sure, I'm sure if you have an older an older, older professor in here who really liked lecturing and who thought lecturing was the way would would combat you on that. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. You need to lecture. Students don't get it if, uh, unless you don't lecture. And I think that we have teachers at North Park that are very lecture heavy mm -hmm. and that I don't remember content from classes because it's so lecture heavy. Mm -hmm. You know, our education courses, sometimes I am just not enjoying them because there's so much group activity but at the same time, I'll take more out of those classes than a class that just sits there and lectures me for two, mm. two and a half hours. And I'm just like, what time is lunch? <laughs> <laughs> so, which, is, which is why I did tell you that I enjoy your format of classes where students have the reign to speak as they, they feel mm. and you participate the conversation. And I've never learned more about Europe from what we learned last semester. So, I don't know. It's To me, that seems to be the style of history that I would like to teach in. But I know that my style of learning is so different than anybody else's. You know, it's different to your style of learning. And trying to format that to fit a classroom is going to be very difficult, especially like this semester. I had students and... At one point, I set a bar lower so they reach it, and once they hit that point, I'm just like, this is terrible. <laughs> like, this is really bad. Like, I thought, you know, the amount of work was going to be sufficient for them, and they would pick up and learn the material. They got great grades, but they didn't learn the material. Mm -hmm. And that's because I set the bar lower for them. And when I start setting the bar higher, I started getting a lot of, like, lip service, because you know how students are when they have to do extra work. No one wants to do work. But mm -hmm. they were actually starting to learn things. And when I expected them to do a, a group presentation on a robber baron, which I assigned to them, they learned more about their specific robber baron and how robber barons are, what a monopoly is, what a trust is, than they would have ever mm -hmm. from the text. Because it, it's boring, man. No one wants to just sit and read and then have to... But that's, the, yeah, out the, but that's the issue with history. That's the misconception with history, is right. that it's boring. I have a, a woman in my ESL course, because I... The course that I'm in is with all the, the graduate students. Uh, Dr. Bartolome said that she wants to take students who have past experience with ESL courses into her course to get the higher level thinking with the grad students. And, you know, a lot of them say, I hated history until I became a grad student, where I realized history is not what I was taught at all. And the standard of history to me, or at least the education in general, of trying to teach a student to take a test and be good at test taking is such a disservice to them and their learning because you have students who come out of school saying, I hated that experience. It was the worst thing in my life. Yep. 
And then you have that pure the academic students who are like, oh, that was fine. So, you know, I look at my little brother, for example. He hates school now. He graduated from high school. He did he did pretty well. But he couldn't tell me what he learned in history courses. When I asked him, you know, what did your teachers do? Or what did your teachers teach you? Do you remember learning this? I remember learning about it, but I don't remember anything from it. Yeah. And and that's the issue. You know, I asked him, oh, what would you get in your ACT though? Oh, I took the, I got a 24. I'm like, if you retook it, could you get a 24 again? Probably. And that's because he knows how to take a test, mm -hmm. but he doesn't know content. He doesn't know what he learned. Yeah. And now that he's trying to, now he's in college and he doesn't like it. He wants to go to trade school. He feels the, what he's learning in trade school is more applicable to the real world than it is to academia. And he's like, well, now we have to learn. He's like, because he went to uh, IBW 134. And he's like, well, in the classes, we're learning how to bend bars to 90 degrees. And we're doing like tangent and cotangent and all these different like, you know, trigonometry within 30 seconds. I said, well, I bet you never thought you were ever going to use it in the real world. And I see that's where the applicability comes in with things like that. But how do you get, how do you change the misconception in history that history is a field that doesn't work for students? Because I, I'm sure you have students coming into your class who sign up who are just like, oh, God, what did I do? Oh, come on. It's a GE class. Nobody wants to. A GE I mean, everybody, I mean, the phrase that most is, most commonly connected to GE is get out of the way. <laughs> get the yeah. GEs out of the way. It's true though. So, you know, nobody's there because they want to. Nobody's saying, oh, I have to take this course because it's such a fun course and I'm going to learn so much. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's one of the things you have to, you have to get that barrier. So that's why I've taken the approach that I do. So it's completely disarming because it's not like anything they've experienced before. And so they can now try and approach history differently. And how long did it take you to get to formats like that where you went from lecture to, you know, student-led discussion? Like, that's all our class was, was student-led discussion. And, you know, whether the student who was presenting that day understood what they read or not <laughs> is one thing, but, you know, you weren't up there lecturing. You know, everybody had the ability to actively participate, whether they did or not, is yeah. something else too. But it was there. Yeah. You know, the system was there. How long did it take to get to that style of teaching? For that class, not that long, because I, I wanted it to be more like a, a graduate seminar class just because of the content. Is because that how grad school is? A good, at a good grad school, that's how it should be. Yeah, most of the classes are seminar classes. And what you do is... Uh, the professor has some readings, and you'll discuss the readings, and then people will present the research that they're doing. Hmm. See, but I also feel like that's apl applicable. 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 To life, too. I mean, to, to sit there and talk about a reading, like, you are expanding off ideas, you know, sharing those ideas with your fellow uh, graduate students, and just coming up with something completely new it's only something whatever that you're reading and it's to have that communication between people that's extremely important and that's ne necessary in society as well so I feel like we just need to get you know past that barrier that well, what you know, part of it is that you have to be willing to to realize that there are going to be bad classes right you know there are going to be students who don't know how to lead a discussion who don't as you said don't understand the material and, you know, class is not going to go as well as it could have if you were leading it. But you have to give the student the opportunity to fail. Right. They're, they're going to learn by doing it. And so you have to, you just have to sit there and bear it. <laughs> <laughs> so then do you, then why have the class, because I know for me, I felt so much more comfortable in sitting in here than I did in the classroom. I don't know if it's just the being in the classroom, it adds a little bit of pressure to you, where you feel it's more formal, which of course class is formal, yeah. but sitting in the class here with you uh, last semester, or well, last, last year, year now, yeah. uh, it was like, hey, this was cool. I really enjoyed that. I, 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 felt, I would have much preferred to have the class in here. It was just a matter of numbers. Yeah. Uh, just how can you change the classroom 
world then within your class seminar? Because is there a way for you to have a class seminar in another area where it's like, you know, couches and people can come in and sit down and relax? I well, not relax, but you know what I mean. I have been arguing for 25 years now for a seminar room. And falls on deaf ears. And it's large, I think it's largely economics. Yeah. The problem is you need to have a certain number of students in order to make a whole in class worthwhile. Mm -hmm. And we were very lucky that that course was really under enrolled. I mean, we only had eight. Okay. Last course. year. Last year. So oh, well, we only had eight, but there was like three people here, four people here. <laughs> yeah, there was <laughs> Mike, Adam, me, and um, Nick. Is it Nick? Not Nick. I was um. Oh, what's his name? I can't remember his name. The cat with the ponytail. No, 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 no. Uh, wow. The right, the military history guy. Yeah. Oh, I can't. I can't remember his name. The guy. Who, oh, Nathan. Nathan. The guy Nathan who. Nathan. The guy who used big words. <laughs> yes, always. <laughs> There was a joke that we had that he was just reading the dictionary and using big words anywhere he could <laughs> without actually comprehending what they meant. But it's like he drove conversation. He really he, did. Whether he was right or wrong, he added to the conversation, which is what I liked. Yes, he was he was very good. Holding his own and and also what I liked too is that he was persuadable. Yes. You know, if he if you convinced him otherwise he would change his mind. Mm -hmm. Which is this is why I like the seminar type of discussion, you know, just having students come together and just bounce off ideas from each other and like, oh, well, I thought this way and maybe, you know, the way that you think. I mean, creating something new almost out of, you know, these discussions, that's... Well, you create, even creating controversy in your class is still pretty cool and exciting and fun to see as a, I'm sure as a teacher, it's just like, yes, this is kind of what I was hoping for. Yeah. You know. So why don't we have more seminar-style classes? Why is it that, you know, because we, Raby has seminar, like, lessons. And I think those lessons go really, really well. Mm. And other professors, uh, Professor Docker, I think she had a seminar lesson, like, once that in the class I took with her, and I thought that really went, went well. And I picked up this year, and I learned, even if it's something so minute, like, here they lie dragons, or here they be dragons, you know, Something like that, <laughs> but then I, I start making the connection back and thinking back about what that class was about and why we were even talking about that in the first place. <laughs> but things like that is, is how, for me, at least how I remember things. And you know, so why doesn't the history curriculum have more seminar style courses here at North Park? Um, as I said, I, first off, I think it's first off economic. You you have to have a certain number of students in order to make the, a class viable. Uh, Secondly, we don't have places for that kind of thing, except over in you know, the Johnson Center. We have a couple of classrooms that are, are suitable for that. And the other is that when academic buildings are built, they don't consult professors. How many times are teachers truly 100% prepared when they walk into the door? You know, how much of it do they wing? No. How much of it are they, yeah. like, all of it? <laughs> planning? How much are they planning during their prep? Yeah. And I'm sure it's on the, on the same level for college professors. Oh, yeah. You know, like, how, <laughs> how, how prepared are you really for your lesson? And when you're prepared, I'm sure everything goes pretty well, unless students just, you know, don't show up or you're just mentally not there. Do you read along with us, like, when we would do our... Because I know you already read... The books oh, yeah, I read, to, I read the stuff. Did you read them, like, yeah. the night before, mm -hmm. like, yeah. would? Okay. okay. So, you no, know. I, have to, I have to keep it fresh in my mind. It <laughs> would be very difficult but, to try to bring up conversation off of something from your recollection. Yeah. yeah. I've tried it. But, <laughs> That's uh, very hard. I, I, I don't come with, with questions. That just comes out of the conversation. Yeah. And that's kind of what I try to do when I leave lecture, or when I love class lecture. It's like, okay... What do you guys think? Give me something to build questions off of. Like when I was a class lecture here, you know, if, if Mike or if Adam didn't have anything to say, because the, I don't remember the other three guys that were in here, just sitting in the corner. Was it George that was in the class? With George, George was in the class. Uh, yeah, was... He didn't say a word. No. 
Well, he didn't say a word in the, <laughs> in the seminar either. He doesn't say a word in the education classes either. Yeah. I don't know how he wants to be a teacher. I, you know what? He's, I feel he's like done he's with mini teaching. Is he doing mini teaching? Yeah, he did mini teaching. I don't know. I love you seeing how he is in classroom in classrooms because he's. Not I would like talkative. to see him teach because he is very like to himself, quiet. That could just be like the same thing how you said. You know, like public speaking, you can't do public speaking, but you can do speaking within like in front of a classroom. Maybe that's the same thing. You know, maybe for him, just having small conversations, one thing, but that maybe power dynamic. Who knows? Maybe. But that concept that would make it easier for him to talk to students than it would to adults. You know what I mean? Plausible. <laughs> Not for certain. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's an idea. Uh, it's an idea. It's an idea. Something I wanted to talk to you about, uh, Professor, that you mentioned before, it was talking about when they made new buildings, new academic buildings, they don't consult um, professors. Um, I feel like that's a trend that they do with all teachers and all levels, they don't consult the teachers when making big decisions. The board of education aren't even consistent, uh, or consist of mm -hmm. teachers or former teachers and more business people and um, people of the like. Yeah. So, how do you feel about that? Like knowing that the educational system isn't relying on the educators themselves, but people who are outside of that realm. Well. You know my work on the German educational system, and that's, you know, this is, when I get to the chapter on the United States, this is one of the things that I'm going to, to emphasize. I mean, the, the Germans set it up so that the professors were in charge. We have a system in which the board of directors is in charge. Mm -hmm. And the board of directors is, by and large, businessmen, because they can raise money. Yeah. And... Buildings get built not necessarily because there's an academic need for it, but because some donor wants to put their name on a building. Wow. <laughs> no, that's, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Hence, the Johnson stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and Carlson. <laughs> well, actually, Carl, North Park was actually did a, a good job with, with a couple of these buildings. Carlson is named after a missionary. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a donor. Mm. Okay. Um, Old Main is not a. No, I, don't, I don't think it's a person. No. <laughs> uh, but in many places, many schools, it's, it's just a matter of, of who's donating the money. Yeah. Uh, and so it's more what a donor wants than what. Yeah. You know, and, and the other thing is, too, very small frustration on my part. But I want to have my my thousand level classes. I want them arranged in a circle. But that's not how the chairs are arranged. When you go into the classroom, it's all rows. So I have to do the rearranging, mm -hmm. and I can't leave it that way. I've got to put them back because of the after next class, class because of the next class. Uh, if I had my own classroom, you know, I could just. But you don't. You're sharing classrooms. So you can't have it the way you want. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a small thing, but it's, you know, it's a nuisance. The other thing, get along with that, is that the, the classroom is arranged so that the projector and the screen are on one wall. But if you're arranging things in a circle, you'd want projectors on multiple walls. But you don't do that. You can have a long way. Right? So. Because the assumption is that class is going to be electric course. Mm -hmm. yeah. that you, I mean, that's the basic, you know, setup for college class is that it, the assumption is that you're doing electric class and that there's going to be a PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even yeah. like in movies and TV shows you see that where yeah. people are in giant lecture halls and it's just like one's facing one way. Well, so look at our lecture hall, which isn't very big, but, you know, even our lecture hall is still all one direction, mm -hmm. you know, teacher-centered. Right? Yes. So then, I guess another question is, during this, during that time in Germany when they're having, like when they're creating these, the universities and they're making these seminar classes, was it like these, just, was it like these big, because before I can imagine there's just big rooms of lecture, right? I'm assuming. Actually, the, the way that 
where most classes were held was in the professor's home. Oh. Which is why a lot of, like, from what I've read about, you know, historians, you know, they have very, very good relationships with their teachers because they're probably getting drunk with them, too. <laughs> yes, it's <laughs> probably true. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, you, you had the, the lecture hall would have been a, a small, you know, basically the living room. The professor's living room is where he pulled the class. Because, hmm. you know, the enrollment at Harvard in, in around 1900, any idea? 400 students. 400. Wow. That's it. That's it. It's like North Park. In the exactly. No, I mean, <laughs> most colleges... I mean, we had a very small college population. It, it exploded after World War II. But before then, college was, was a very, very elite thing. It was just a handful mm -hmm. of people who would do it. So you think that's changed how society works now, that you know, almost anybody can go to college? And, and that's a problem. Oh, well, no, well, it's a problem because there are people who are in college who have no business being in college. Like, I, I would, in order to get people into college, we've sold college as a way to make money. You mm -hmm. need to yeah. go to college in order to get the job. It's true. Whereas, and this goes also back to my research, I want to sell college as a way to become a good citizen. Yep. Because that, that to me is the, to me that's one of the core frustrating things is that we need in order to be a good citizen in a democracy, there are certain things that people who vote have to know. Yeah. And it should be the responsibility of the nation as a whole to make sure that the bulk of the population knows these things. Mm -hmm. so, that, so then why is it that they, you know, from like the 60s and 70s where college was almost free, you know, did the U.S. government or did capitalists view college as a way, like, hey, 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 look at all these people going to college, let's make some money, or did they want people to not be protesting the way they did in the 60s against the Vietnam War, you know, was it that because too many people were going to college, the government was like, hey, hey, you guys are seeing too much of what's actually going on here, so they tried to make it expensive again, or made it expensive when people didn't go, but then now I think they're Capitalizing it as well is that okay. some is that like at least a viable thought? At least oh, no, of course. I mean, you have a group of people who believe that college professors are lefties, and that our job is to radicalize students, and so you want to make sure that either college is so expensive, or it's. You don't want your tax money going to radicalize students. So <clears throat> it becomes then, you know, instead of looking at education as a collective responsibility, we need educated people in order to have a functioning democracy. There are people who look upon it as college is your responsibility because the purpose of college is to get you a job, and I don't want to have to pay for you getting a job. Damn. <laughs> yeah. Wow. wow. Mm -hmm. And the person we have most to thank for this is Ronald Reagan, who, as governor of California, well, technically, um, I believe the public school, public universities in California are still tuition free, but you pay through the, the nose with fees. That's that's how UIC is too. You know, my little brother. They say that the base tuition for all in-state students is like five thousand dollars. That sounds very inexpensive. My brother this semester has to pay over ten thousand dollars because of fees, and I was just like mind blown. That's like that's so unfair. Of course. And this is probably why people choose private education because at least there's a little bit more. Um, it's a little clearer in what you're paying for, unlike. You know, going to UIC, where it's all in the in the hidden 
uh, times. Charges. So you would rather them smack you with the full price and smack you with a lesser price with more fees. Well, yeah. In the end, why why claim that something is a certain price when you go and get it and it's like four, th- four or five thousand dollars more than what you're actually charging? And he's not living on campus. Wow. He's commuting every day. And it's still that expensive. And it's still that expensive for him. So I save so much money by commuting to this <laughs> place. It's a forty-five minute drive, but God. It's so worth it. So much more money's been in my pocket ever since. It's yeah. incredible. Well, you know, that's one of the big... I mean, for me, this is one of the big frustrating things, is that, you know, I know that, frankly, a lot of the kids that I'm teaching, I am ripping off. Because they're not getting out of my classes, but they should be getting out of it. And they're paying huge amounts of money and not really getting an education. And it's just very frustrating. I, mean, I, I feel, you know, I feel like I'm kind of dirty almost. You know, <laughs> it's, you know, it, he's a con man. <laughs> on a certain level, yes. Unintentionally, but... I won't, I won't, I'll admit that. So, I'm not going to put that in. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's interesting. Just the, the educational system and the lack of Care almost for the like for the people who are actually in it and are seeing it day by day are not the ones who are consulted, and I don't know why we've decided to take that route. I know money, obviously. Money and and the other thing is is the man what's called the managerial revolution around the eighteen hundreds, late nineteenth, early twentieth century, late nineteenth century. Uh, and it's really un- unfortunate that you have this, uh, we, we developed the field of scientific management, uh, Taylorism. Uh, he was a guy who uh, was what we would call today an efficiency expert. You know, he did all kinds of scientific studies to try and make things uh, run more smoothly. And one of the group of, that he developed was the school principal. Well, you have, and what happens is you have the, the you know, the country, the, the, the traditional little red schoolhouse and the school marm, one person in charge of all the education in that particular area. Now you put them together in an urban school and you throw a manager on top, the principal. The principal is not somebody who's been in the classroom. The principal is somebody who's gone off and studied management. I mean, I can understand why they would do that, but just, I don't know, that seemed, it doesn't seem right to do that. I think, no, I don't think it's right either. So then, would you say that it's right for somebody who was a teacher to then take those classes to become the principal of the school? Well, what is the value added that the principal brings? Uh, a more, co- I, I would believe, a more cohesive uh, group of teachers who are trying to teach a core value that the school is trying to push. But like these these cultural people who are diversity, in, for example. These people who are in management are like theoretically um, taught to like do things a certain way, right? But which, which and so then when they get into the actual, you know, school, all that theoretical bullshit's out the door and now you're stuck with the real thing. And the only people who truly understand that are the teachers, and now this guy ahead of us has no idea what the fuck's going on, <laughs> and now we got to deal with him. So, which is that's why, what doesn't Which is why sense I asked the question, though, what about somebody who was a teacher at one point, who then became a principal, who has an understanding of how classroom management works, who has an understanding of dealing with parents and dealing with students, and... Or, why not just have the teachers get together and have a faculty senate? Elect a leader. Yeah. Within the other teachers. Like there is a, like a, in a, fa- in a faculty department, there's we a head of the department. department. Why can't there be a head of the teachers? Where each of the heads of the departments are each, it seems so simple, but why don't we do it? it d- Tell that to the government who's funding your school, though. Well, that's the thing, is that we've, we've this is, this is why I'm writing what I'm writing, because we have embedded this system and the, to be, the system is fundamentally, I mean, from the get-go, the system is fundamentally flawed. Mm-hmm. 
Because, I mean, come on, is Betsy DeVos really the most qualified person we can find to run <laughs> the Department <laughs> of Education? Oh, yeah. I think she's great. She's <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm surprised she hasn't set up schools as a pyramid scheme. <laughs> <laughs> She's oh. been selling samples or something. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, where was it? Was I think it may have been in your class where we were discussing how the the cusp of education in the world was Germany at one point. Yeah. And you said that it shifted to the United States. Would you say that it shifted out of the United States now? Because at one point, I do believe that we were trying to learn, but it's become so standardized. Well, and that's and what this is what I've third chapter <laughs> of the book uh, in Europe as part of the European Union. They're going through something called the Bologna process, mm -hmm. and the idea of Italians. Well, <laughs> the idea was that just as you know. If you're a citizen of Europe, you can live in any of the countries in Europe. So the idea was to uh, make it so that if you were in a university in Europe, you you could go to any university. You know, if you were a college student, you could go to any university in Europe. The problem is how to coordinate all those different academic systems. Well, that's where the, you would need a bureaucracy, correct? Well. Yeah, and what they decided to do was adopt the American system. So uh, they're now, <laughs> so now it's going to be credit hours and seat time uh, that determines, you know, what kind of education you get. Hmm. And damn, a German. There are many German professors that are up in up in arms. Yeah, because they, they love their system. So are you opposed to the credit hour system? Oh my goodness gracious, yes. <laughs> See, for me. Even thinking about college, I know about credit hours because of you know college prep schools, but I didn't know there's other systems other than that. I thought that you know our way was the only way, and that's it. You know that it's been a system that's been established for such a long time. And you know. the the credit hour system uh, was first developed at Harvard, and the idea was that the uh, president of Harvard had studied in Germany. And he wanted to bring this idea of Lehrfreiheit, freedom to learn. Because it had been the case that in American colleges, you had this prescribed curriculum. You, know, you, you just went in and you started your first semester and the courses were all laid out. You had no electives, no options. It was just go through the curriculum. And when you got out after four years, you were done. Mm -hmm. But he's decided that he was going to bring Lehrfreiheit so he decided that we're going to, you know, have you know, just people taking courses. But of course, this being America, you just can't give people the freedom to choose whatever they want. <laughs> you have to direct their freedom. <laughs> yeah. And so now we he then created the, the credit hour system. And so now you know that you're done with your course with your coursework, not because you've reached the end of the program as you did with the prescribed program, but after you've collected this hundred and twenty hours with courses. That's insane. Of course, it's insane. Man, yeah, you would think that from all the you know ed educational like reforms and the way people were thinking in, in the back in the day, like you would think that it would carry over. It's, but it's just no, because what we what we did in the United States was, I mean, this is chapter four. <laughs> <laughs> what we did was we took this this model of this prescribed college college curriculum, the liberal arts curriculum, it was in Harvard and Yale, and, and then we had the the Merrill Act in 1862, which created the land grant colleges, and they were to be you know kind of practical. So we would have two kinds of colleges. But many of the land-grant colleges also wanted to have the liberal arts college. So we have this one institution that is both a liberal arts college and a career college. And we smash them together. Then, in the 1870s, we start the uh, imitating the research university. So we put a research university over these two things. 
So we basically have in this in our wow. country three different approaches to education all slammed together in one institution. It's the same umbrella. Yeah. That doesn't seem. It seems like a disservice. <laughs> oh, I think it's. I think it's ridiculous. It does. Yeah. So then, is that why colleges like DeVry and like these other public colleges have different programs like? You know, here we have the IT program. Here we have the, you know, the technical program where you're going to learn technical skills. So, you know, electrician, uh, like fitters. Because whatever. yeah, because oh, while it's still yeah. under the same umbrella, it's yeah. more but focused. But they also don't bother with the liberal arts part. Yeah, that's just a pure technical school. But doesn't DeVry have other sections too within where they have liberal? I'm not sure that they Or am I thinking of a different college? I can help you. I don't know, because I could have swore that there are public colleges oh, yeah, that, many, that have both. Yeah, many community colleges. Community colleges, yes. Yeah, would have, uh, you know, Oakton. Okay. Yeah, they have both a, a liberal arts section and then the technical. Sure, and that's yeah. kind of what I was thinking. Yeah, but, you know, the associate's degree that you get you know, you don't have to take any liberal arts classes to get an associate's degree in auto mechanics. Hmm. Sometimes I take that for granted, like liberal arts aspect of the school and like that connotation that people have when it comes to liberal arts. Yeah. I remember I was talking, of course we were drinking very heavily after work. <laughs> um, but we wanted and I worked with Greeks too, so you know, it's just the drinks just keep coming until they <laughs> Until you're gone. So <laughs> we were, I was, history fascinates me. And just the stuff that I do retain is, um, it blows my mind, honestly. Yeah. And if it's really like that, I'd love to tell other people about it. And other people are like, oh my God, here he goes again. When he drinks, <laughs> this is what he does. He just talks about history. But it's, I always try to get to a point. I don't just say it to say it. Like I'm trying to reach something. Like if something happens, you know what I mean? And just the way people think or work or jobs or things like that. I'm like, this is what I learned. This is nuts. It's crazy. And I was talking about, he's like, where do you go? I'm like, I go to North Park University. He's like, oh, you go to a liberal arts school. Like, that kind of connotation that comes mm -hmm. with it. Because he's, he's pretty conservative in the way, like, he thinks about things. And, you know, that liberal arts view, and the more I do my research paper, I realize how, like, strong those liberal ideas are and how it can change the way people think and the way people do things. And that when we graduate, where we should with the liberal arts school, be able to think in that way when we leave here. So that we, when we go into our careers and we go into our jobs, which or go into the real world in general, we can carry those liberal ideas with us, you know, that a lot of people would think is a little scary. You know? One would hope. One would hope. That that you bring it with you, but in yeah. theory, that's what but, should happen. Yeah, and, and when I I brought up in, uh, in class a couple of times, my, my and I'm sorry, North Park, I don't like much of Christian higher education because it really isn't liberal arts. Right. It is, you know, the denomination has the answers to the quest to these questions and your job is to learn what the denomination says mm -hmm. about these issues. But, I don't know, since I've been in college, I've really taken a step back from religion and to try to look at history and not through a religious lens that mm -hmm. I have because my mother's always been like that. You know, she's very Christian centered. Like the answer to everything is God. You know what I mean? And just you know, so when I'm learning about these different aspects of history and these different things that are going on, it's you know, what's the logic really behind it? You know, you can't just say God for everything. You have to really look deep and dig deep and do your research and I've taken a step back from it you because know, this way of thinking of you know, Christianity, especially here in America, is you know it kind of like takes a step back away from logic in a sense. So when I'm doing history, I kind of, like how I always say I do history, I take a step back. You know, when I was learning about the United States history, I took a step back. I'm not an American. I'm, I'm a historian. I'm trying to read about this. And that's what I do. I don't think of myself as like from where I'm from or who I am, but that I am a historian. And that's how I should be looking at history through an unfiltered lens instead of a filtered lens of what I think is real or what I think is conceptually, you know, what society is right. deemed, you yeah. know, acceptable. So that's how I like to think of it. That's what I've gotten yeah. from a liberal arts school. That's what I've taken from it. And, 
you know, a lot of people think I'm nuts. <laughs> That's what I felt my college experience yeah. has been like in a liberal arts school. I don't know what it would have been like if I went to Ohio State like I really wanted to. You know, I mean, yeah. it's just a public school compared to a liberal Christian liberal arts school. Yeah. Look, I guess thinking, Richard. <laughs> Oh, I'm absorbing. <laughs> I'm absorbing. <laughs> what do you think? I don't know if I feel that I was so influenced by the liberal arts, maybe because I had to work so much. Yeah. You know, my college experience was a lot, you know, being so spread out with my time, I don't know if I had the time to dedicate to actually viewing it, like, you know, from your experience. But I do feel that I'm smarter than I am when I first came in here, I feel like, <laughs> that's <laughs> good to know. <laughs> well, you know, I, I do feel a little more refined with my thoughts. I feel that I am a complete different person, and you know, maybe the the liberal arts do have a little bit of an influence on it. But you know, I, I do believe that it is my choosing to change and to learn because I think, at least with our history program, you know, you're given the option to either learn the material or not learn the material. If you don't learn the material, well, that's on you. And to learn the material when I don't have time, I don't know. I, I just, this is why I was like staring up at the wall because I'm trying to think like, you know, where is my connection with this? You know, there's always this if I could get paid to study and do research, <laughs> man, that'd be my dream career. I'd love to do that. Honestly, I've had, like I mentioned earlier, I've had a lot of fun this semester and just doing my research. You know, I mean, like I still had to work. Yeah. and had to deal with yeah. personal things and their family relationships, whatever. Well, and, but and I had I had all that and many teaching, right? Oh. Which sucked. Which I wish I would have had more time in the history department. Makes me wish sometimes I didn't take education because I do love history so much to the point where I wish I had more time to write this paper on Nicaragua. I don't like. I feel like six months isn't enough time to write all that I want to write. Yeah, yeah. and you know to the point where. All the material that I found can literally become a book, and to put it all together, it does take time. Yeah. And I don't think the six months is enough time for what I want to do, at least. You know, so it's not so much a research paper, more so than thought-provoking work that I'm trying to put out, right. you know? Or that's my goal, is to be thought-provoking. So, Professor, if you were to choose another kind of summative assessment for, you know, instead of a paper, what do you think that you would... In like these, or do you think that a paper is probably what you should do in these higher level education? The the three thousand level, three thousand yeah, four thousand level classes. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I I the the research paper is kind of a standard because it, it forces you to use the skills that history should be teaching: research right. and thinking for yourself, and yeah. all that writing well. Uh, but I don't know, what do you think about a documentary? I, I definitely love that idea. Yeah. Documentary or podcast. Yeah, I think those would work because students actually, for me, writing is kind of hard just because I write how I talk, which is always a huge problem <laughs> I'm supposed to do that. Um, but it's easier for me to talk it out and discuss things than it is to write it down. Well, I, I agree with that. Do you think that a seminar course should be two semesters long? Ooh. Because I don't know if half a semester or a semester is enough to to truly continue to push these metacognitive... All of us in that class are at a point with our education that it's, it needs to start getting more complicated with thinking. You know, it's not so much that we should continue to sit down, and lecture, take notes. I think that we as university students are a little more involved in that. Mm -hmm. And I think by having seminar style courses, and if it was a, a semester long or a year long, I almost wonder what you would see from day one to the last day. How much of an improvement or how much refinement you would see with students writing, with students thinking. And I feel the students coming out of a you know, year-long course are going to have a much stronger understanding with whatever you're trying to get out of the seminar, even if it's just understanding history yeah. or understanding how history has been developed, than just six months of it. 
I love how you made the argument last semester that professors kind of like fight for attention almost. Yep. They do. I, I love that because it's true. And I, that, in theory, is awesome. I agree with it 100% that it should be a whole year of capstone that, of the seminar, you know, so that we can have a better understanding. But students just have many teachings. Some of them have student teaching. Some of them have, you know, other classes that they have to do as well. And then it's like, well, where do I put my focus and attention into really doing that thinking? You know what I mean? And that's why I feel like maybe a year would be better because only six mm -hmm. only six months. So is that how grad school <laughs> works then, basically? Or because that is something that I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm. I'm already no. looking at grad schools and dreading because I have to go pay to take the GRE to get into some grad schools, and it's like, oh god, another ACT type thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, when I was in grad school, we were on the the quarter system. Okay. So you basically had, uh, instead of a 15-week a period, we had our research papers in 20 weeks. So you had one 10-week one section where you started the research and you did the common readings, and then another 10 weeks where you actually did the, the bulk of the writing, bulk of the re research and writing. So it was 20 weeks rather than 15. It was a little better. But no, we didn't do the whole year. Do you think a whole year worth of a seminar course would be good, or do you think that would kind of do a disservice to the course? To to be honest, I think that the problem with doing it over a year is procrastination. Mm. With the, on the end of the students or the professor or both? Both, mm. but, but mostly the student who is going to wait till the. I mean. Even though I, you know, gave, you know, I made it very clear from the beginning, you got to work at this all during the semester. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, it just it just doesn't happen. I don't, I don't say it's necessarily anybody's fault, but just that there are so many demands on people's time today. You know, you're not the only one who's working 40 hours. No. You know? and, and unfortunately, that's become the real common. It's become really common. Yeah. Um, you know, back in my day, you know, <laughs> uh, it was you know it was more kids living on campus and were able to devote themselves full time to their education. Mm -hmm. the The student who was working was working uh, you know a brief part time job you know ten fifteen hours a week. That well, was. they were making extra money for themselves. Exactly, you know, not to, to pay the, bills. <laughs> right, exactly. The bills were you know, were reasonable enough that parents could take out a couple of loans and pay them off was not the burden that they are today. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we first off have, you know, we are now a majority commuter school. So that means that students are, at, first off, they have to commute. Second of all, they're at home, so they have the home distractions. Right. They, they can't sequester yourself on campus. Plus, many of them have to have jobs. Mm -hmm. And I you might be shocked, but when in the early years of that, of this seminar, I had the book list was nine books. Wow, nine, nine. full books, full books. Wow, it's a lot of books. No, it's it, a lot of books, it, but it, it, it is. But if you have students who aren't who are dedicating themselves to their studies, then it, it it's viable. Sense. Yeah, but you know, it's you know, what like a like fifty pages each class, which is not an unreasonable. Yeah, if that's all you're doing. If that's all you're doing. But, you know, it's it's completely unreasonable nowadays. Yeah, because we have this conception of, like, yeah. a working student. If, yeah. you, if you pulled up nine books for the semester, I'd have been like, oh, boy. Oh, oh boy, this is going to be uh, yeah, a no. tough, yeah. tough semester for me. <laughs> well, and if you, you know, you know, imagine trying to lead a class discussion or have a class discussion with, you know... 50 pages a night. <laughs> you know, and... It just it just wouldn't work. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's just what we're what we're left with. Just students who you, you got to work. That's you have to, it. and it's troubling because how much more can you learn when you like throw yourself into your studies? You know, what I mean, it just yeah. that that's what I love. You know, the time that I gave for my papers, just like 
dive in, felt like I was almost there sometimes. But yeah. just like to get mm-hmm. into that mindset of thinking, yeah. that's why I told you it was kind of hard yeah. to shift gears when I was writing your paper compared to writing yeah. Professor Raby's paper. But just when you do that, it's just, I, I love doing it. Of course. Yeah, it's, it's, fun. it's fun. It really, it sounds nerdy, but it's, it's fun. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like just to do that, to really get into something in your work. Yeah, that's what I wanted from, you know, a college experience, but just North Park ended up being a lot more expensive than I thought. So, (laughs) and I mean, any college is going to be like that nowadays. It's it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah, I look at my little brother who's working two jobs, and, you know, my parents told me my agreement with them to pay for school, because I came to North Park to play football, and to join the ROTC program, and to get the full scholarship from ROTC, and, you know, that was going to be my college experience, which I ended up you know, failing out the first semester because <laughs> I ended up dropping the football team my second semester because mm-hmm. I sustained way too many injuries within a short period of time playing college football, you know, that could have been prevented by coaching staff, yeah. but they weren't. Mm-hmm. And I didn't like that. No. And when I tried to get the ROTC scholarship, there was so much, there, there was just so much politics that were involved that I passed everything, every requirement that they asked for. I still didn't get the scholarship. Hmm. And, you know, and I'm not saying anything bad about our Samoan population here, but it was all the Samoan students who were getting the scholarships. Hmm. And I don't know if there were guarantees. And I think you see that too, with because you were on the football team. Hmm. You know, I don't know if it was guaranteed to the Samoans that they were going to get that spot to play football and North Park had an agreement with Loyola or hmm. what the issue was, but it's like, you know, I was running, we were running six miles a day for ROTC. I was running, I ran the two mile in like 13 minutes. I did everything that they required for me to do. And then after that, I would go play football. I would go lift in the morning after the morning workouts for ROTC. And that was the best shape of my life. But it sucked because, you know, I didn't have that experience. So my parents, my my dad saw the injuries I had and said, no, that's it, you're done. And he made the decision for me, which I was upset about. I don't regret it. But he made the decision for me and said, you come work for me, you work for my company, you'll get paid, and I'll pay for your school. If not, you have to find another way to, to pay for your school. Wow. And, you know, that's the option I was given, and, you know, lo and behold, five years later, you know, I'm running the company, <laughs> and still trying to manage school and trying to learn to be the best teacher I can be, the best historian I can yeah. be, and, you know, I, as well as trying to maintain a social life by, you know, having a podcast like this because, mm-hmm. you know, my experience with college, I look at all the other students who live on campus or who have a bunch of friends, it's like, yeah, I can't maintain friendships because of work. I can't maintain anything because of work. You know, all the events on campus, you know, how many how many times did I tell you throughout the semester, oh, I wish I could go to that, but I have to. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and, and that really sucks, you know, that they make college so expensive for students that we can't even enjoy a full experience, that I had to grow up so much faster than I wanted to. You know, when I look at, you know, pictures of Dr. Lakaitis, when he was my age, he had his hair dyed, slicked back, and, <laughs> you know, looking like a traditional liberal arts college student. You know, where there's me, it's like, yeah, you don't know, not all the time I look like a college student. If I'm coming in my work clothes, you guys are like, yeah, this guy's a scrub. <laughs> but, you know, all my clothes are work clothes yeah. or, you know, shirt and tie. That's yeah. there's no in between anymore. Yeah. Right. Well but that sucks. <laughs> yeah. Well I it's you know, it's not just college that's problematic. I think that this is that we live in and I'm sorry to say it, but we live in a fundamentally mean country. That's such a nice way to say it. Yeah, actually <laughs> <laughs> you apologize for it. Too. <laughs> like, sorry to say it. We live in a mean country. We do. No, we do though. I have I have a friend from Ecuador and he tells me how much he wants to go back to Ecuador. Because life over there, yeah, it was hard. That he struggled. But he still if he didn't want to go to work, he wouldn't get fired from it if he didn't go one day. You know, he could sit back and relax and have coffee with his mom in the morning, then go to work, work and then come back and have a dinner, relax, you know, go play with his friends, have to knock it up the next day. And you drive yourself into work and yeah. he says that's all it is here. Yeah. You know, yeah. he's, he's 29 years old. He came over here when he was 22, and he's like, since I came here, that's all I've done is work. I haven't gotten the, he's like, I traveled once, and that was to Tennessee. So I haven't had the freedom to do what I want to do. And, you know, I asked him, I said, have you heard of the streets paved in gold? He said, no, I never heard of that, but I've heard of the American dream. Oh. And he said, I don't want it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I laugh, but, you know, 
he just, you know, to see the, the struggle that he's going through, and he said, you know, to you, this is the best system because you were born and raised into it. You're working in it. This is normal for you. But for me, this isn't a normal system. It's not a healthy system. No. We, <clears throat> which is probably why we have so much obesity, which is why we have so many heart attacks, which is why we have such sick people in this country. We are not a healthy country. No, we're not. And, and we make it so that it's almost impossible to get health care. Yes. Mm -hmm. My daddy's mom works for Menards. And she has dental care where she pays 150 every two weeks out of her paycheck that all it covers is cleanings. Oh, gee. When she needed a root canal, she had to go to an outside uh, company, which is somewhere on Archer and Harlem. She got insurance through them because at least they give discounts on that. So she left that one to join that insurance, but it's like, even then, it's still a discount, and it's only like 20%. Yeah. And you know how much root canals are? They're like 1200 bucks. Yeah. They're so expensive, and, you know, there's no aid for people. No. You know, and if you get aid, good luck paying it back, or good luck, you know, being part of society, because then you just get hooked on being, getting that aid, and then what? The government sees, oh, you make a little bit more, okay, no, no more aid for you. You know, it, it makes it so difficult to try to live in this society seeing how things are. It's because the people who have money want to keep the money and they don't want to help everybody else. Well, when I was in Italy, I just felt like, I told Gaddy, I said, I feel free here. Yeah. You know, I know we're on vacation, but, you know, I look at everybody here, you know, it, it's wrong. I'm not going to sit there and say, yeah, all the stores closed down for lunch, but stores did close for lunch. Sure. People were enjoying coffee. People were conversing. Uh -huh. People were relaxed. And it's just like, it feels, it doesn't feel the tension you feel in the air that you do in Chicago. I, I agree. Uh, you know, south of France, if, if I could retire any place, it would be the south of France. Why? Sitting out, to, to have the two-hour lunch, you know, sitting outside under an umbrella with your glass of <laughs> wine, the bright sun, Ugh, and it's just, it's just relaxed. Yeah. You know, the idea that most people eat lunch at their desks, even though they're given, you know, you know, given a half hour lunch break, yeah, well, you can't, you can't take can go it for half an hour. Exactly. Unless it's right next door to you. So you eat, you know, if you're going to take a break, it's fast food, mm -hmm. which is unhealthy. Yeah. <laughs> and if you try to get healthy food from that fast food place, it's expensive. Yeah. You know, once a salad at McDonald's, 10 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. Where you and can, you get sick. Where, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or you can get 20 chicken nuggets from McDonald's for five bucks. Like, <laughs> yeah, I'll take the 20 chicken nuggets for five it's, bucks. It's, well, it's a much more complicated way to make food in the chicken nugget, but yet it's cheaper than just something that comes out of the ground grown. Yeah. But it's like even then, I mean, can you really trust the shit they put in the salad? <laughs> no, no, I'm not, I'm not saying it. I mean, come on. I worked at McDonald's. My brother works at McDonald's. It is the worst. Oh, yeah. I worked at a grocery store. Yeah, I know how it is, man. It's just, it's not... It's because there's too many of us. Like, we can't it, we can't simplify things. You can't just depend on farmers to make everything anymore. We have to mass produce things so that we can put food in people's mouths. I mean, you know? <laughs> My grandma was telling me that there's some place in Mexico did a documentary on, on this self-sustaining guy. He does not touch the outside world at all. Hmm. He has hydroponics in his basement. He's a millionaire. He's okay. got a lot of money. But he's got hydroponics in his basement. He grows his own fish, two fish out of his own pond. <laughs> he has his own animals. He has everything. He's got his own system that collects rainwater. Like, he is completely unattached from the world. And my grandma was ripping this guy. She was like, this is ridiculous. I don't understand why he's doing this. And I'm just sitting there like, this guy beat the system. He's a genius. Yeah. <laughs> like, Wow. I would love to do that. But, you know, he had the ability to break away from the system, and that's yeah. that's so hard to try to do. But see, like, even... Which is like, why I, I do believe that people are leaving the United States. You know, you have young Americans who are going to Europe to go to free to get free education. You know, go to a place in Sweden. If you work there for five years, they give you citizenship. I don't know if you're, you're aware of that. I did not know that. There's a, a Swedish school who is partnered with North Park called English and Skolen. And I mean, they and they come in, yeah. high, recruit teachers from here, they pay for your flight, they pay to help they pay for a bunch of things for you to come work there. They pay you to work there. They help find an apartment for you. 
to help teach you Swedish for free. And then after five years, if you decide to stay there, they'll give you Swedish citizenship without having to renounce the American. Wow. And you and with that Swedish citizenship, you can go and study and get a master's or PhD in Europe. Ooh, that sounds like and to that's me, so it's like, man, I'm over here like foaming at the mouth because it's like, <laughs> wow, that sounds too good to be true. Mm -hmm. Which it, it may be, but... You know, I don't know anything other than the United States. And if I had the opportunity to go, like, I was just enthralled with Europe. Even when I was in Berlin for 18 hours, like, I just love Berlin. Berlin's a nice, great city. It, it felt so different. Being, like, even, it's a huge city. It's a beautiful city. And it was freezing when I was there. <laughs> but it still felt so different. You know, walking down the streets of Berlin, it's just like, it feels different. I don't, I'm sure yeah, you can attest to it. It doesn't feel like an American city. And it's clear it's not an American city, but it, it, the tension's not there that it is here, like, in Chicago. If you go downtown, it's just like, oh, you know, while you're driving. <laughs> but because there's just so much tension. Right. You know, people are, are always moving all the time. Nothing stops. Right. Because that's just, that's the culture that we, that we have nowadays. I mean, even my parents tell me, you go to school, and then you go to school some more, and you work while you're doing that little bit of school, and then when you're done with school, now you're going to be working for the rest of your life. Like, great. That's why my dad has a big emphasis of, like, going and traveling the world before you start working, because once you start working... It's over. It's over. I would yeah. love to travel the world, but that shit's expensive. Right. I found a flight to Cuba for, like, 300 bucks in March. Like, late March. To Cuba? To Cuba. Yep. Nice. For, like, now, I think a week. Very nice. Yeah, so I'm like, well, that's, you know, if you... If you pick the time right, sure. you can go anywhere and do anything. You know, it's just finding the prices. But, but again, that goes back to the American system of constantly working. You don't have the time. You have to request to take time off. Yes. Like that's ridiculous to me. Yeah. yeah, and most people only get two weeks. Yep. Yeah, I, think so. I guess that's part of the reason that I do want to be a teacher too. Because at least as a teacher, you have wait, oh at least a month in summer to the go. Three through. best things about teaching: June, July, and August. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I, I believe it. Yeah, I believe it. You know, some some schools pay summer, some schools don't. And if you can find a job that pays you summer, awesome. I've been watching The Office lately. Uh, <laughs> uh, Professor, have you watched that show? The Office? The Office? Of yes. course. So well, Everybody's watched The Office. Well, you'd be surprised at how many people say no, they haven't watched But, you know, just that I always thought, can I ever be a desk monkey in my life? So, I don't know if I can ever do that. I think it would drive me insane. I would like to have a desk. <laughs> I mean, but like, you have a desk. But like, I mean, you know the the old movies where you see like the college professors like office, and it's just this huge room with with a filled with book yeah, yeah oak bookcases. The uh, you know he's got his whiskey in the in the thing. Like that's something I would like to do. Like that's what I would like to have as you an know? office, <laughs> huh? As an office, as an office, yeah. You know where I have my my nice super cool desk and. Where it's an ambiance that I love, mm -hmm. you know? Is that what you have at your house? Or is it you have like a desk? I have a desk, but, it, but there's, it's not a fancy fancy desk at all. Yeah, desk is a desk. I, I had this desk that uh, I got from my grandmother's house, but it was just, you know, because, like, oh, sure, I'll take it because, you know, I moved in the basement, so I needed a desk type of, um, and I just fixed it up, like, not even a couple of months ago, and that's where I do, like, that's where I sit down and do all my research and stuff. Just put on my headphones and just, the spread so you used to always think that I can never do work at home because you know all the distractions right, right oh, there. and so I've always wanted to well I've always spent like you know if I have a class in the morning with you and I have a class at night well I guess I'll just stay in the library to get some work done yeah. you know what I mean because if I go home I'm just going to sit down and watch TV <laughs> play some video games and take a nap those are the only three things yep. I'm doing so but now I feel like I guess it's not where you go it's your determination behind what you want to do that's just my aspect of it. You know, instead of, you know, I have to be in a library to feel more academic. Like, I feel like I have the motivation to do it. Right. Or to drive home 45 minutes. And just, <laughs> just something about the library. Being in that, you know, or in your library, it's that energy in the library. Mm. Just that mm. academic, like, studious type of feeling. Or mm. where at home, you know, you may have created this energy where it's just like, I'm a couch potato at home. Like, I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to play video games and watch TV and basically, you know, drink and eat and Sounds be merry. Yeah. <laughs>
But nowadays, if you try, I mean, if you try to go to Brandon Library and try to find one desk somewhere, good luck. Really? Is yeah, it, it's, it's so packed. Packed, though. Wow. And they have, uh, was it BYOM? Bring your own mugs. And they have coffee yeah. for free. And all you have to do is just bring a mug with you. Uh, coffee is awful, though. Yeah. I, I used to, uh, a while back, I had an office. My office was in the library. Really? Ooh. Yeah. And do you prefer this at the library? I actually prefer this because the office that I had was a uh, window, a uh, glass, glass wall, oh. and you know, being on display all the time. <laughs> Did you have at least blinds that you could like? No. <laughs> I also like having the, the comfy furniture. True, true. I like that chair. I like the color and the design. Almost like rocking in a sense. Yeah. I, like that. I like that. All came from uh, you know, thrift stores. To... My dad could tell me stories of thrift stores because he used to, when he first came here, that's where he used to shop all the time. Actually, the thrift stores that we have right there on uh, Lawrence. Lawrence. Oh. Yeah, and um, just he'd always say, I went there, and there's one. So it was just easier that way for him, too. Uh, and my brother's really big into thrift stores, too. He always finds, somehow, he always finds nice outfits, nice outfits when he goes there. He always comes out with at least two or three outfits. I'm like, good for you, man. He's not paying an arm and a leg for it yeah, like he wears in the malls. Goodwill. There's a Goodwill in Willowbrook, or, one of the, or Woodbridge, one of the wood things out in suburbs it's in like this super affluent neighborhood where people go and just give away the things that they buy that they don't use i found like michael kors bags brand new. actual brand name mm -hmm. like it has that michael kors thing on it for 20 bucks i'm just like i know this is probably like five years ago like but it's still a main brand like why yeah. don't people come here <laughs> it's just we can live i guess <laughs> Well, I think it's a sense of pride too. That's also very true. Yeah, you want to you want to be caught shopping somewhere with a name brand on it. You'd rather wear the Nike than just a regular black shirt. You know what I mean? I sorry, I don't understand that about people. Why are you paying to advertise somebody else? It's a brand name. It's just what people do. They they want to emulate. If they, emulate want, if they want me to advertise for them, they pay me. <laughs> True, but that's the brand. That's marketing. That's the way people build. Yeah. Like, like that's. But why do people buy that stuff? I don't get it. Because normally it starts with, um, kind of like famous people wearing it. Like if you see, um, like Jordan for an example. Jordan's shoes were the thing, and Jordan has made that you know that oh. market for his shoes, and not just shoes anymore. But now he's making shorts. He's making shirts. He's making hats. But I almost I mean, wonder if it's like the young population who and. Decided. When I was in high school, Champion was something you bought at Walmart for like mm. ten bucks. Now Champion is becoming like Nike in a sense because all these kids are like, nah, forget Nike, I want Champion now. And it's just like, because you know what's going on, and it's crazy because my my brother, he's the same age as your brother, incidentally, um, but. Just he likes that '90s and '80s nostalgia, that mm. style that came from that time. '80s more in particular. I think the '90s, 90s were bad with style. <laughs> I really do. I look at pictures of me when I was young, and it's like, man, Mama, why would you dress me like that? Why would you give me this bowl hair? Like, I look terrible. <laughs> Come on, Mom. But like they, that '80s, you know, because my parents are like, well, that's what we used to wear when the we Joe were Dirt look. The what? Joe Dirt. The Joe Dirt. No, not like, <laughs> not the mullet. No. <laughs> but like that, you know how the 80s, how they were dressed with the the very um, fluorescent colors, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, the color scheme and all that kind of stuff. That's what people are, that's what people want to dress like nowadays. That's what the younger generation is doing. They want to emulate that because they just find some, something fascinating about it. Mm -hmm. You know, and I can't find a style to save my life, but at the same time, you know, man, jeans, gym shoes, and a sweater can never go wrong. Yeah, right? <laughs> then, you know, like cutoffs for an example. I love cutoffs. You know, but that's not socially acceptable to wear that anymore, apparently. Sure it is. Go do it, man. I do. But it's just, you know, my belly sometimes shows. When I went to Miami <laughs> and I was a little skinnier, I wore, uh, it was so funny. I went with, um, I went by myself, but every time that I went to, um, like, to a bar or to, like, a restaurant to sit down, everybody would look at me, like, take second glances. And sometimes I would show up with like a woman, they would be like, Well, look at this tourist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wearing my sandals, my shorts, and my cutoff, you know. <laughs> you know? That's what I tried not to do when I was in Italy. I tried not to look like a tourist. And you can tell an American from a European like this yes, in sure. Europe. Yes. Yeah. Like 
you can, you know. I tried to dress up nicely. I had nice cardigans. I had nice, like, button-down shirts on. I would wear a tie if I wanted to. Went in Rome. Dude, there's a <laughs> Roman dude. Dress nice. So we dressed nice. And when we walked around, we would look at the Americans who are just, you know, wearing jeans and a t-shirt, looking super basic, or, you know, looking at the girls in leggings. It's like, yeah, you can tell they're American. <laughs> <laughs> and... You know, it was almost frowned upon to be like a tourist in Italy. I don't know if that makes sense, but like, you know, I understand Italian because of Spanish. Like the Italians would, like there are people who would speak to me in Italian, ask me questions in Italian. I'm like, oh no, I'm American. Oh, oh, you understand English? Yeah, I'm from, you know, I'm from Wisconsin. I'm like, oh, all right, well, <laughs> you know, and that's because of, you know, I, not that I'm trying to like emulate right. people, but I tried to dress appropriate mm-hmm. to where I did. I kind of blend in with the crowd instead of standing out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you for yeah. Thank you again. Awesome. We do My appreciate pleasure. it. Yeah, it was awesome to get your perspective on things. And we didn't even talk about East Germany. We did uh, not. We we'll, did. We'll have to yeah. uh, <laughs> do this again another time if you okay. if you'd like to do that. Yeah. Sometime next yeah. semester. Yeah. yeah, of course. Well, that concludes another episode of History's Benchwarmers. Um, guys, thank you for listening again. Actually, first I wanted to ask you when do you when do you think about your book coming out? When did you? Start? I have no idea. Okay, well, <laughs> when it comes out, you guys should read it because just a little excerpts that we had to read you is it's an awesome book. We'll post the um, link when it's out. <laughs> yeah, but awesome. Thanks again, guys, and we'll see you on the next podcast. Peace.